Hello and welcome back to my channel. This is an update video on my hand project. Longtime viewers are hopefully aware that I'm trying to fill all of the slots on my device trial. I still have a few slots available, so if your disarticulation is the same as mine and you're interested in trying out my gear, go to the printables website and download the check socket to ensure that your residual limb is roughly the correct size to fit into the void space of the device. When I announced the trial last month, I noticed a few comments saying that the requirements were too restrictive and limiting. So I thought I'd address some of those concerns in this video. But before I talk about that, let me talk about how I'm able to fund this trial. Earlier this year, I applied for and received a fellowship grant from OSV to see if the idea of bringing to market a partial hand prosthetic device is viable in a DIY format where the end user refines and assembles the mechanics of their device and then later fabricates the custom socket interface. With this grant, I anticipate being able to furnish the mechanical components to 12 to 14 devices for amputees whose fingers were amputated through the MCP joint with complete amputation of the fingers indexed through pinky. This device is not intended for amputees who have retained any portion of their proximals or whose amputation is transmetacarpal. They also need to still have enough of their thumb to act in opposition to the fingers of this device. The base of the thumb also acts as an anchor point for the strap to go around to hold the device in place on the residual limb. So that's the deal and the type of amputation that I'm looking for. Now let's talk a little bit about the why. First, why only amputation through the MCP? What if they still have a portion of one or more of their proximals? As you can see from this rail and proximal assembly, when the residual limb is properly positioned in the device, there's not room for anything past the end of the metacarpals. If the device is moved forward, spacing the metacarpal bases off of the anatomical metacarpals, the geometry of the finger no longer works as designed. It creates a condition where the thumb isn't long enough to cross the index finger at the medial to form the key grip. The key grip is used to hold pens, utensils, keys, anything where the thumb pinches against the side of the index finger. Next, what about transmetacarpal, where the amputation takes place through the middle of the metacarpal and palm of the residual limb? This sets up just the opposite issue. If the metacarpal bones aren't long enough, then the winder assembly will sit too far down on the hand and into the wrist where when the hand is flexed to its maximum position, opening the fingers, the winder assembly hits the radius bone and forearm side of the wrist. Now, you could space the metacarpal bases off the anatomical metacarpals, and that would work if you had lost, say, a quarter, maybe a half an inch at the most from the natural length. The issue is going to come in when the anatomical metacarpals are no longer completely supported by the bottom mounting rail. When the device is seated with full length metacarpals, the force needed to close the fingers is evenly distributed across the area just behind the heads of the metacarpals, not actually on the ends of the bones themselves. If you try to do the same thing with shortened metacarpals, you'll be putting all of the load onto the very ends of the bones, and depending upon the condition and shape of those bones, you may not be able to repeatedly load that area without causing trauma and deterioration of the skin. And that's just issues related with opening and closing the fingers. We haven't considered anything to do with the lateral motion used to splay or lock or unlock the ring and pinky fingers. Really, it's just better to figure that if you have a portion of your proximals or your metacarpals have been shortened from their natural length, this isn't going to be the ideal device for you. You would probably be much happier using gear from either Point Designs or the MCP driver from Naked Prosthetics. Next, why the DIY? The reason for the user being the person to assemble and fit the components is actually threefold. First, if they put it together, they should be intimately familiar with how the device functions and therefore be able to diagnose and repair the device when it needs maintenance. Hey, the index finger is a little bit draggy. They aren't going to have any problem disassembling the finger to clean or clearance the individual components. Second, it takes roughly 40 hours to fit and assemble the device. I charge $150 an hour at my machine shop. That's six grand. I'm trying to make this device as affordable as I can by offering it in a base kit form. 
If the assembly and fitting truly is not your gig, you can always hire a machine shop local to you to do that work for you. Or as schedule allows, you can hire me as a machinist, not a prostheticist or a clinician, but as a machinist that gets it to assemble your kit. The thing is, the raw components cost roughly around $6,500. And when you add 40 hours of shop time, that brings you pretty close to 13 grand. Now, generally people have more time than money, so I'm trying to make that an option for them. Same thing with the sockets. If casting and vacuum resin composites aren't in your wheelhouse, you could always hire a clinician local to you or one of the clinicians that I've talked to that get what the project is to build those sockets for you. On average, I'm hearing that a pair of sockets will run between five and six grand. Or for somewhere around $1,000 worth of materials and some time, you could learn how to cast your residual limb and lay up your own sockets. Thing is, the best clinician will never know how the socket feels on your residual limb. And if you know how to fine tune the fit, you'll be able to spend whatever time it takes to get the perfect fit. And when your residual limb changes shape or size, or you lose or put on a bunch of weight and your socket no longer fits, you can take a weekend and make a new set of sockets. If you do it all yourself, you're not going to be subject to medical markup or someone else's schedule when your device needs maintenance. That is way better than being without your device because it needs to be sent off to some lab in Ohio because they're the only ones that can work on your device. Third, because this isn't a licensed and approved device approved by the FDA, and I am not a clinician or a prostheticist, I cannot legally supply you with a complete and finished device. The penalties for manufacturing a medical device without proper licensure or clinic are quite steep, somewhere around $100,000 per occurrence and 10 years in federal prison per occurrence. Your clinician reaches out to me and inquires about me supplying the completed mechanics for a bill that they're doing for you, I can absolutely do that because the clinician has a magic wand that they can wave and declare that the components are suitable for use in a device. The trick comes with coming up with the correct billing codes to get the insurance to subsidize any portion of your build. I've learned a few things with this trial. Mainly that there's a sweet spot where someone is going to be open to this kind of device. You want to catch someone after they've healed and their residual limb has started to settle into its reduced shape and before they've really settled into whatever gear insurance is agreeing to provide. That's another thing, insurance. If insurance is willing to provide you with a Mayo device to the tune of somewhere around $85,000 and all you have to do is come up with your portion of the deductible, you're probably going to go with that, even though my device is much faster and far more durable because my device isn't FDA approved and insurance isn't likely to agree to pay for any portion of it, that's going to limit its appeal to anyone who has insurance. Also, once someone has settled into using a type or style of device, unless it absolutely fails to meet their needs, it's unlikely that they're going to swap to something radically different than what they're using. It's a big deal to put in the time to figure out how to pick up and put things down without always dropping anything. And even more if they've started to consider their device as part of their body. It would take a lot for someone to want to start all over with that process, especially if it's going to require effort and cost a bunch of money just to try it out. Another thing is the aesthetic. The thing about being an upper limb amputee that differs from a lower limb is that for the most part, if the amputee has put in the practice and figured it out, I've met individuals that can pass off bilateral through the knee amputation as walking with a little bit of a limp. Whereas if you're missing part of your hand, unless you've constantly got it stuffed in a pocket, which is eventually going to get a little bit weird, it's going to get noticed. It's a giant magnet for attention, especially if it's adorned with a shiny robot looking hand. Now, even though I think the mechanical clockworks look in raw metal is plenty acceptable, even kind of cool, it's not going to appeal to everyone. And that's okay. It doesn't need to, but for those that appreciate the gadgetry of the device, it's an awesome accessory that's going to become your new identifier. Hey, do you know blah, blah, blah? Who? 
You know, the guy with the robot hand. Oh yeah, I know who you're talking about. If you're not into that kind of attention, you are not going to be happy with this as your gear. So, if you are or know of an amputee that meets these requirements and they're interested in swapping to my gear, go to the printables website, download the check socket, print it out, and send me a picture of your partial paw to missingpartsclub at gmail.com and I'll set up a Zoom to discuss all of the details and expectations of the trial. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Thanks for watching. Yeah? What's up? Did you have an exciting day outside today? Yeah? Very exciting. Yeah. You a good kitty? Are you a super good kitty? How's your shoulder doing? Somebody kind of ate on you a little bit ago. Your shoulder okay? Yeah? Okay. You happy to see me today? Yeah? Okay, should we go get the mail? Yeah? Do you want to go get the mail first? No? What's up, guy? Hey, buddy. You go inside? Yeah? Okay, let's go inside. Let's get some treats. Okay. I'm glad you had a good day outside. <laughs>